on his African tour in which he had to visit a number of African countries and leaders in 2007, the guide carried the entire household along with him, Soraya inclusive. While in Konakuri, the capital of Juni, Gaddafi never hesitated to summon Soraya in his room in the middle of the night to rape her. The next time she was invited while abroad, was able to dodge him by putting up a lie that she was in her periods. She went ahead to smear pads with lipstick to be able to convince Gaddafi's messenger that she was in such a state. This was so because the guide's messengers do not stop at statements told to them, but go on to inspect. Her survival was short-lived since they later found out she had told a lie. Consequences were dire as she was slapped first by Mabruka and then Gaddafi, on top of which beat her up, spat on her and insults fold. Time for finding a way out of Bab Arazizia. Soraya had got fed up with the guide's harassment. Together with his father, they hatched a plan of escaping from the jaws of the monster. It was leaving Libya for France. It all started with a call made by Soraya to father narrating to him the state of affairs at Bab Arazizia. Soraya had been subjected to all manner of harassment ranging from physical to psychological at the hands of Muammar Gaddafi and his clique. She let her father know all this. The father immediately told her to board the car and find him somewhere with her passport. Fortunately, she had it. Luckily, she told one of the drivers she had had an assignment to accomplish as soon as possible, asking him to wait for her for some few minutes so she could execute the mission and come back. Remember, she had earlier been assigned to join the Revolutionary Guards, the army that forces Gaddafi's security. She then jumped onto a cab to go and meet her father. Soraya found him waiting in his car that she immediately entered and headed for the French embassy to submit an application for an emergency visa. They also needed photographs and her fingerprints. The father had connections at this embassy and this made it easier to process her daughter's emergency visa. By the time they left the embassy, they had been assured the visa would be out in a week rather than the usual period of one month. They then embarked on a journey to see Soraya back in Bab Arazizia. They opted for minor routes, consistently looking into the rear mirror until the father dropped her daughter to a taxi that drove her to meet the driver who was waiting for her and then went back to Bab Arazizia. Pressure for her to disappear was also coming from her family. Parents were seeing her as an embarrassment to the family and a bad example to her sisters and brothers for having engaged in two sexual activities before marriage. This was forbidden by both the law and religion in Libya. She felt isolated by her family. Soraya had also learned drinking alcohol and smoking. She was a total disgrace according to religious standards in Libya. She thought of death or leaving Libya as receiving her visa. Soraya approached the guide telling him how her mother was sick and that she wanted three weeks off. This was a lie though. She was given two in his stage. Time for moving to the airport came. They got dressed in camouflaging clothes to hide their identity as they moved to the airport. Father was very careful to ask a friend Soraya's name does not appear on the passenger list or even the initials. The plane soon took off and had the first stopover in Rome, Italy, and finally in France. Soraya had regained her freedom and joy. Her body could now rest from regular bruises and sexual harassments from Gaddafi. However, her escape was short-lived. Her run away from Gaddafi was temporary. After the elapse of 15 months, Soraya flew back to Libya. This was on 26 May 2010. High costs of living, lack of a job, and her failure to speak French do not allow her to stay in the city of the light, Paris. She came back with nothing. She learned that her family and boyfriend had been harassed, threatened, and pressured to produce Soraya by Barbara Zizia in her absence. Trouble set in. As soon as she had arrived in Sati at her mother's house, Mabruka called in from Barbara Zizia. She let her know that Gaddafi looked for her when she was abroad. 
she told Soraya that they discovered where she had gone, which surprised her. In the same call, she told her the guide needed her immediately back to the jaws of a tyrant. She hesitated going back some days until Mabruka picked her from her mother's hair salon in Isati and delivered her to the infamous Bab Arazizia. Upon her arrival, as usual, she was taken into the lab for blood testing before meeting the guy. You know well the purpose of conducting blood tests when you arrive in Bab Arazizia. Rape and other forms of harassment resumed. Soraya grew stubborn and arrogant as one of the moves to survive his confinement at Bab Arazizia. Indeed, it worked as she was ordered out of the place to her mother's home. She did exactly that but never had peace at home because she had slept with the men before marriage, ranch drinking and smoking which were all against religious and state laws in Libya. She was looked at as a disgrace to the family. Rape stopped the day Libyans hit the streets to protest the arrest of the lawyer to the prisoners that had been assassinated in Nab Salim prison in 1966. His protest ended the 42 year rule of Gaddafi and ended his life when the protesters finally killed him on October 20, 2011. Libya is another victim of Gaddafi's rape. She chose to be called Libya on grounds of hiding her identity. Libya was lured into joining the Revolutionary Committee in the 1970s. Being part of this committee was viewed as a privilege for it would lead you into the elite forces guarding Gaddafi. The colonel always encouraged women to serve the revolution and become finest allies of the guide. She roughly spent 30 years with Gaddafi. Libya dropped out of school and devoted all her energy to serving the interests of the Revolutionary Committee. She even went ahead to learn how to launch rockets. There was a hidden agenda behind the establishment of these committees beyond the ritual objectives. On a fateful day, the women activists received the news that Gaddafi wanted to meet and greet each of them in person in one of his residences. They viewed this as a blessing. The group selected one of their members to go and meet the guide first. This was Libya and she was 15 years then. A girl that happily entered the apartment came out with blood flowing on her thighs. This was on 1st September 1979. The other activists were shocked by the gesture, though work continued as usual since criticizing the guide was reasonable. The second time she was raped came when a group of activists went for her and delivered her to his residence. He had made a visit to Benghazi. The activist undressed her completely and pushed her in his room crying. Despite pleading for mercy from Gaddafi, he went on and raped her without uttering any word. She never told her parents about what had happened to her. Libya lost her marriage within two weeks for not having her virginity. The man asked for divorce after finding out this fact. She ended up staying at Babu Arazizia like many women who live in rooms at the same place. These live at the mercy of Gaddafi and are essentially his sexual objects. All they do in the day is eating, sleeping and playing sex depending on the moods of the guide. After raping them, Life becomes hard for them since many can't get marriage for lack of virginity and being persecuted by their families. Involving in two sexual activities outside marriage is criminal in Libya. Their families see them as embarrassments and are better off in Barbara Zizia than their homes. At least they had freedom to take alcohol and cigarettes while at Gaddafi's palace. Libya escaped to Greece for fear of losing her life following her warning to a mother of two daughters and Gaddafi's hidden intentions. She let her know that Gaddafi wanted to trap and rape them. Unfortunately, the woman opened up to Gaddafi and this amounted to the violation of conspiracy of silence which could lead to her killing. However, Gaddafi's network tracked her down, brought her back to Libya and ended up in jail until the start of the revolution in 2011. Watch out for the next episode. Do not forget to subscribe, share, like and comment. Let's meet again. My name is Mutawe Dan Bosco. Thank you for listening to me.